Ardith, how are you? I'm good. Glad to be here. Good. She's joining us from Alabama. And we're up here in uh, wintry Canada, and it's freezing and blowing snow. <laughs> I wish that this was not virtual. I wish I was down in Alabama um, chatting with uh, Ardith on her couch. But these are the, the way things are these days. Um, so uh, at Leveling Up, we're really, really um, passionate about artists' stories. We tell stories, um, our artists' members' stories, our navigators' stories, our masters' stories. We have a wonderful uh, writer at Leveling Up. Her name is Janice, and she interviews our artists and shares their stories on our uh, social media and on our new blog, which you should go to the website and check out. There's already dozens of stories there. Um, there's so many stories of hope and of struggle and of victory and of courage and courage is the big one that always uh, comes back to me. I think artists are um, some of the most courageous people because they put their heart out on a canvas or on paper or whatever it is and um, and then ask the world to to um, experience you know through them and their experience and to even be judged. Um, and it takes a lot of courage to do that. So, um, Ardith, you are in Alabama. You're a colorist. Yes. And you paint beautifully, and I'm going to quote, um, I think it's from your statement, imperfect abstractions and figurative works in mixed media and acrylic. Yes. You're globally collected and you're an in-demand mentor. When we found you, we were really excited because you were already mentoring artists and that's what Leveling Up is all about. It's more than a workshop, it's about mentorship, about actually getting in relationship with a master artist and other artists like you uh, to learn and grow your skills. Um, so uh, you, you haven't always painted, your life took some twists and turns from being an award-winning educator to having your spine shattered in your sleep yes. and being in, on disability and then building a meaningful and successful creative career. Um, remarkable even to read that out loud. Um, I'm excited to dive into that story. Um, you are absolutely determined to use creativity as good medicine and your enthusiasm and energy are contagious. Welcome, Ardith. Thank you. So, so very glad to be here. Mm -hmm. And to our audience, thanks for coming. And know, as always, everything at Leveling Up is live and interactive. So if you have questions or comments, put them in the chat, and we will try to get to all the questions um, as we go. And this is a you know, I have my my wine. This is not about drinking alcohol. If you have wine or water, I don't care. Um, I have a snack too. This is, <laughs> this is about uh, just connecting and being together and hearing artist story. All right. So how about, um, why don't you take the ball and run with it, Artist? Tell us a bit about your kind of creative journey and how you got to where you are today. Okay. So I, I'm from Mobile, Alabama. It's where I was born and raised. And I started out as an elementary school teacher. My first degree was in PE K through 12. And then I got my, my master's in early childhood and then certification in elementary ed and then my national boards. So my whole you know, world was teaching the littles and mm -hmm. I love doing it. And the year I got my national boards, my, my spine, deteriorates too quickly so everybody gets degenerative disc disease in their lifetime because we age we have arthritis mm -hmm. but I got it when I was 23 years old and it kind of runs in families so my the discs in my spine had are prematurely aged so I, I just my discs blow out and when your spine is off your gait is off and when your gait's off your joints wear out yeah. so it's kind of a domino effect um and when I, the year I was at the height of my career and I had to give up teaching, I had to go on full disability because I was really sick. Um, I've had 28 total surgeries, but really 20 plus orthopedic. Wow. And uh, it was soul crushing. It was just like, what? Because my brain was fine. My brain was fine, but my body was just shot. Yeah. And I had asthma and a lot of side effects from the medicines. I was on 14 meds a day and morphine. It was just crazy. So I'm like, what am I going to 
do for my sanity at this point? Because my husband was a, a teacher. He's retired. So I went to the library and I checked out books on watercolor because I just loved color. And I thought, well, if I have to sit up in bed and recovery, I'll play with watercolors because what else am I going to do? Like, I just didn't know. And I found very quickly that I had a gift for visual transfer, meaning I could look at things and then just interpret it and use color. And I was never afraid of the, of the medium, meaning okay. uh, I was not intimidated by watercolor. It was just a means to use water and color on a paper. And it made me happy. I had no intention of becoming an artist like none. It was just something to do. <laughs> and I started, you know, playing around with sketching and I quickly realized and my friends, and my family who saw my stuff said, oh my gosh, you know, you should sell your work. And I'm like, wait, what? Um, because it was unpredictable what my body would do. But one thing led to another and I was in therapy and I remember my psychologist at the time said, Art, they're gonna have to paint your way out of this. Ooh, because it was, it was, you know, I struggle with depression because of losing everything and just my whole history, which was crazy. Um, and friends supported me and one thing led to another and I got into a co-op gallery because when you're on disability and you're able to do some things, but not a lot of things, you still have um, opportunities to contribute to society. And I was able to get in a co-op gallery and, you know, go down there once a month and it opened doors for me. And one thing led to another and I started to understand that the act of creativity and engaging in my art helped my mind, my spirit, my body heal. I was in physical therapy. I got in a saltwater pool. And over time, I saw that there was light at the end of the tunnel. All was not lost. So I just committed to painting and using painting as a way of being expressive of how I felt. But I'm also an avid self-study person. I love to study and to learn and to better myself and to work on my craft so it was I was kind of voracious in that hmm. and it just um I just kept moving forward and my spirit began to heal and as that happened uh I was able to go back to teaching to see if I could do it and I, um I went back to teaching twice and I was pretty successful at it I was teaching art. I'm, I don't have a degree in art, so I'm totally self-taught, but my master's is in education, so I was working in a smaller private school, and I absolutely loved and adored it, but I realized very quickly that I couldn't do both. There was no way I could manage teaching in the classroom full-time and then painting full-time because I was actually doing that, um, so I was able to come off disability completely. I'm no longer on 14 meds a day. I still live with tremendous physical challenge, and mm -hmm. at any moment, I'll have to pivot. But um, I made a commitment and a decision that I would become a working artist and do this full time. So I dove headfirst into learning the industry, learning the business side of things, as well as working on, you know, my creativity and my craft. And then I began teaching online as well. And mm -hmm. I sit here today. It's almost a miracle story to be honest because it's I just never thought I would be where I am today um and art is part of the reason why I mean I just couldn't be more grateful mm. yeah awesome. thanks for sharing um yeah I without the 20 plus surgeries and that sort of thing I I relate to your story in that I had no intention of becoming an artist mm -hmm. and I hadn't I would have never guessed I'd be here today and art has uh changed my life for the better for sure uh so you don't teach anymore you're full-time artist now. I don't teach in the classroom I actually teach online so I I have a membership and I teach online uh, adult painters online courses like I'm fixing to launch my 2022 schedule which is um, the push past ordinary series of courses for painters I've done that about five years and I absolutely love and adore my students so oh, I'm sure that they love and adore you too that's awesome um so part of what I have read about you that I'm wondering if you can uh, elaborate on is that you spend a whole year studying and defining what gives artists their style a whole year you do, you dove into that like you said you're voracious right you, mm. you dive in and search and search tell us about that i'd love to 
So yeah. here's the thing. I, when I made the decision to, to do this as a profession, I knew that the industry required me to have a consistent style. Well, because I'm self-taught, I did not have a mentor. I didn't have an academic background in the arts or professors to turn to. Um, I, I asked, well, what gives an artist their style? So I started using Pinterest of all things and pinning um, to boards of artists that I was interested in that I felt had a strong style. Mm -hmm. And what I realized was they had a technical way of constructing their artwork that was consistent over time. Mm -hmm. um, meaning the colors that they used, the brush strokes that they used, the ideas that they used were a recipe for visual language, their visual language. Okay. And so when I could break it down into the components of what visual style means, I knew that I could identify my own, but there was something missing. There was a component missing because I knew it wasn't simply about technical way of painting. If that's the case, you can learn to render or copy any artist you want. Right. Um, there was a personal component to it in their point of view. So the point of view was really important. Why okay. they painted what they painted and how they painted mattered to their point of view as well. So that technical framework paired with that personal framework was the sweet spot of visual style for artists in my interpretation and understanding. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I sat down and this, I was like 40, I don't, I don't even remember 40 or 42. And I start for the first time in my life, I asked myself personally, what mattered to me? What were my core philosophies of the world of life in general? And then technically, how did I enjoy painting? What did I enjoy and love to do? So I knew I loved color. Um, I knew I always loved story because I was a creative writer before I ever picked up a paintbrush. Okay. Um, I knew I knew that I loved transparency and light and shadow through glass and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then my personal framework was I have this belief that we are imperfect human beings, but we're so beautiful and valuable. Mm -hmm. I have a love of dynamic movement because I was an athlete and I can no longer do that. So the energy that comes from dynamic movement is fascinating to me. And then because I'm a person of faith, uh, energy comes in many, many forms. And I spent a year studying energy and the structure of energy, but it's also, there's a spiritual faith of Holy Spirit and all, you know, the energy moves through us and from within us and around us from a science point of view and a spiritual point of view. So when I, when I figured it out, I was like, all right, I know what my core beliefs are. What do they look like visually? Like, how can I interpret those through paint and pigment? And as soon as I understood that, it was an aha moment. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can fracture the line. I can fracture, meaning break apart color planes. And that can connect me to imperfection. I can do figurative abstraction and distortion because we're imperfect, but we're valued and we're beautiful. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I paint energy and that movement all comes from what's moving around a character as much as it is from within the character. So the personal understanding gave me the ability to technically interpret it from a point of view. And that is how I built my own visual style. And it blew the top off of my world because as soon as I understood it, I was tapped in. Uh, my first show, I had 37 huge pieces. And it was simply because that understanding came with clarity and it was exciting to paint. So now, regardless of subject matter, like I can choose any subject matter. I know I'm going to interpret the subject matter through my framework mm -hmm. and that gives me my style. So I, I, um, I it was kind of a di divine moment, to be honest, because it's, it's not something that you learn in books. At least the one I haven't written yet. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's wow. That's uh, my mind is a little bit blown. I'm taking that all in. Um, what a, uh, a like organic but um, intelligent way to tackle something so, um, you know, so non physical, right? Like to, I, I really relate to the the spiritual piece too, and I think a lot of artists do, whether they have a faith or not, that they're mm -hmm. they um, can feel and sense 
sort of the the spiritual space and interpret it um and i think that's a, a great um kind of honor and privilege of being an artist to share that with the world so wow i love how you translated that into into paint and pigment and um wow i also knew too so because of my faith i was called to, to paint in a way that impacted the human heart of others it was it is important to me and i'm passionate to paint in a way that people can look at it and realize it's not realism it's not hyper realism it is imperfectly expressive and mm -hmm. that builds a bridge of communication and connection with the viewer and it opens a dialogue for me to have a conversation with them and when i can do that i can share my story of courage and challenge and overcoming and it's the bigger point so the wall experience of what hangs on the wall is part of the art but the story and the connection is as important as the art itself mm. and i realize not every painter approaches that way you know some it's just about the art but for me by choice it's twofold so i'm grateful that the act of painting gives me the ability to make those connections mm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Um, you've talked about before the need as creatives to rise above the arrows of negativity and doubt that come at us and that we sling ourselves. Can you talk a little bit about what you've learned and how to face those arrows? Yeah. So in, in me connecting with, you know, adult painters and students, one of the things that's epidemic is imposter syndrome. It's in mm. most fields, but it just is. Yeah. And there's this inner voice that we tend to have. We're our worst critics, but we carry a lot of baggage around in the sense of we're putting out this product to an audience mm -hmm. that's going to be judged. And typically, if it's not realism, it's and it's abstract or weird or odd, like there's an eyeball on it, the end of a chair, <laughs> somebody's going to look at that and go, what the heck? Like she must not, she is one brick short of a full load, right? <laughs> at some point you've got to come to the belief and understanding that your mark matters your point of view matters and life is extraordinarily short mm -hmm. so why waste another minute worrying about what an external audience um will judge you for but put out what your heart says you're meant to put out to an audience that you resonate with and be confident and bold about it because in a split second our lives change you know your career's gone your body breaks down and i'm just not willing to live any moment of my life uh under the foot of the expectations of somebody else now with that said it does help to be able to articulate a story an interesting story about why that matters to you and why you paint the way you do because that's how you amplify and resonate with certain people. There's almost 8 billion people in the world. Yes. And artists tend to think that there's never going to be a unique idea. But here's what my belief is. Out of almost 8 billion people, there's only one of you, Julie, and there's only one of me. We're not replicated, which means our experiences and our beliefs and our ideas at some point as they break down are unique and distinct they're different than everybody else's because of what we experience in our lives right and if we can tap into that well source what i call fringe work and create from a place of connection and expression to that we can create a product that is that is our version of beautifully different Mm -hmm. so that's that's what i teach now and that's my passion of how why i create the way i do um and i do realize it, it's counterintuitive or it's a little bit different than what the industry is used to but it doesn't matter what the industry is used to it is what i'm passionate about and that's why i share passionately this is how i found my way mm, yeah and that's what i want every artist in the world to hear yes 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 um, I know, and I've said this before um, to our members, that uh, the artist journey, as far as I've kind of seen it and experienced it myself, is that first we want to start and paint accurately, right? We want to actually... Right, you learn the how. 
yes, the, the how, and I want the mountain to look like a mountain or whatever it is. And then once we can do that, we spend the rest of our career trying to let go of that mm-hmm. and to find our, what is, what are our mark making skills and our interpretation, right? Um, the letting go is so, such a big part of the artist journey. Um, that's amazing to hear how you've tackled that. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's interesting too, because um, the letting go, it's the brush strokes and, and just giving yourself permission to study and learn the skill. Skill building is huge and necessary. I could not paint the way I do without studying realism. The fundamentals mm-hmm. of art matter so much. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you spend time and devote to studying the craftsmanship of fundamentals, but you pair that with your unique way of expression, you, you're, you have the ability and you're equipped to create a painting that is different. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm trying to teach painters because I love knowing how to paint a realistic whatever I need, but I love distorting the stew out of it because skillfully I can, and it means a lot to my heart. So yeah, mm-hmm. they're, they're, they're married between the two. Yeah, that's, um, that's interesting too, because I hear that a lot too from our master artists at leveling up that, um, that the foundation, you need, to, you need to have a foundation of uh, drawing, we hear a lot about, and yeah, understanding composition and color theory and all that sort of thing, and that that gives you a platform to launch from, and, and then it gives you permission to break the rules, right, that you, that you learn about, and then how to break them well. It also connects to creative confidence, which is mm-hmm. something else I teach, because here's the thing. The, the imposter syndrome lies at the heart of somebody feeling like they're inadequate. Mm-hmm. So the, the understanding of the fundamentals and practicing and sketching, it's not to box you into having to do things perfectly or with exactness. It is to equip you to have a strong foundation mm-hmm. of how you can build your expressive skill on top of that. At least that's a my point of view. Um, And that's what a lot of artists miss. They feel like, oh, I've got to study. I've got to learn how to draw accurately or sketch accurately. And it's it's not about the control or perfection. It's about being equipped to give your your, um, intuitive expression a whole lot of legs and skill. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. Um, I've read you, you've said that I carry ick around like a wet blanket. Yeah. Can you talk a little <laughs> bit about that? <laughs> so from an early age, um, I, I just depression is a thing. Uh, it's, you know, my, when I was 10, my mom and I were robbed at gunpoint. We just had a lot of trauma. People have trauma in their lives. Mm-hmm. And I just kept a low grade depression over time. It was just part of my nature. Now to meet me, I'm a little vivacious and very, you know, perky and optimistic you probably wouldn't know it but I struggled with depression for a long time I was hospitalized for it and I never could seem to release the hold of being depressed and so I named it my ick it just you know through therapy I'm like I had to to understand it and my therapist when he said you're going to have to paint your way out of this he challenged me to paint put a face on the ick because if I could put a face on it, because I'm so visual, I could then understand a little bit more of how to tend to it. And it was an amazing thing because when I painted it, it was a grotesque little bitty, hmm. I don't know if it was male, but it was this little bitty figure and the eyes were sad. And as soon as I painted it and I had a face to it, I realized it was a very wounded soul. So what that gave me the ability to do was when I was feeling ick, I could visualize and I could have a conversation in my head with that. And I began to send it love instead of disdain. Oh, interesting. And Hmm. over time, I was able, that that entity or that it healed. And it released me from the hold of, just that low grade depression, I was able to come off medication and it changed my life, just the visual shift. So I'm grateful to understand that 
ick. It's something that we all tend to experience, at least many of us. Mm -hmm. Um, Life is hard. COVID's hard. I mean, it's stressful, but it doesn't have to be a wet blanket that we stay smothered by. It just doesn't. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you use, um, does it inform your art that the pain and depression? Yeah. Oh yeah. So the, the fracturing of the line is all about brokenness. Okay. It's all about the imper- imperfection rather than painting a perfect face. And sometimes there's a few paintings where the face is not fractured. The rest is, and that's uh-huh. very intentional. But mm-hmm. when I paint, um, the brokenness and the fracturing is connected to that in that we're, we're imperfect human beings. You know, we all struggle. We have challenges, but that doesn't mean we're less valuable than somebody who's not going through it. That's just my belief. So I paint that through. And then in the eyes and in the facial expressions. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Fabulous. Um, I struggle with chronic pain and I know that there's a lot of people that struggle with yeah, depression or pain, um, different, different struggles, right? And I think that's part of Part of the problem, maybe if I can say it, is that we because we don't share, um, because it's hard to share, right? You need to be vulnerable to share that we don't know those things about each other. So we don't see how alike we are and how broken we all are and how we're just doing our best in our and right. uh, interpreting things differently. Um, yeah, that's a really, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I know how some of our members that uh, I've heard their stories too, and how art is healing for them. Um, Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So what I found was turning to creativity. Uh, There was was one year after a a major back reconstruction. Uh, I was pretty much in the bed and one of my friends came over and said, look, we can't get you out of bed right now, but you can, you can cut out of magazines and we can do collage. I did not want to do collage. Like what? what, Like, no, she was insistent. So I just started cutting things out of magazines and I started to understand the pieces that I cut out of the magazine. I could reconstitute into objects and I found a use for it. And what this gave me the ability to do was to understand that despite the pain, despite the brokenness, healing could take place through the act of being creative, through waking up and choosing to pick up a pencil or pick up a pair of scissors. And instead of immersing myself in how I felt, which was depressed or in pain, I could entertain myself as well through paint or crayons or glue And that experience of, there ended up being thousands of pieces of stuff for weeks. Like my poor husband, I think he probably slept in the other bedroom. Um, (laughs) But I I did that while I was also in therapy. So I seen a psychologist and he said, you you know, when you need to, you're going to have to paint your way through this. I created an art journal. So this opened the door for art journaling for me. Hmm. And I gave myself permission I named it fractured because that is my whole world. My body was fractured. My life was fractured. It was just bad. Hmm. I gave myself complete permission to paint whatever I felt on those pages. And they began very dark, Hmm. very dark. Because I used to have just horrific, horrific nightmares. Hmm. Um, But over time, over the course of the year, the pages got lighter. Light started coming back and infusing my experience. And by the end of it, I was so in such a better place emotionally, spiritually, and mentally. Um, Had I not engaged the creative act, I don't know that I ever would have gotten out of it the whole, I I really don't. It was, the creativity was a superpower. It was good medicine. Mm So I've even talked, I've been interviewed um, with doctors and and, uh, physicians who use art as that much. I wish looking back on my whole medical journey, I would have had more doctors say to me as a treatment plan, you need to add creativity to your treatment plan as well as this medication. Because it was so powerful and transformative for me um, because 
because scientifically I really shouldn't be able to walk. I really shouldn't have been able to come off disability. You know, my prognosis was not good. And here I sit. Wow. Reading. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. How many um, of you who are here have, have done art journaling? Um, I have, I haven't done done that I have art sketchbooks but they're always you know with an agenda of creating something um would you recommend artists that in general this is something we should all be doing so there's different ways to go about it there's basically sketching you know sketchbooks um artists use to work on composition do color studies there's technical sketchbooks right working journals um Art journaling to me is simply using a book, either a blank book or an altered book and choosing to incorporate some um, medium such as crayons or paint or pencils and tap into that creatively. So I have altered books that are just random free play. I have books simply based on color, based on sketching. Um, but the art journaling where I can free form writing or uh, emotions and paint that is <laughs> huge because think about it. If we hold in what we struggle with and don't find a way to get it out in a positive way, it's going to kill us because stress does that and illness does that. But if we can find a way to have a release mechanism, like on a pressure cooker, but it's that release valve. Well, the art journal for me was that because I was angry. Um, I was depressed. I was frustrated. I was discouraged because I could no longer teach and do the things I thought I wanted to do. So being able to take books and paint um, and the freedom, the act of creative play is what gave me the ability to transform the ick and all of that struggle into being healed and having a pathway forward of what I was really connected to as a human being. Mm -hmm. um, I do not have a professional practice without my art journals. They are integral working journals for me, mm -hmm. not only as a painter, but as a human being. Mm -hmm. Do you ever um, take something from your art journal and create a painting from it? Oh, from yeah. Yeah, a lot. Everything in my journals is fair game to inspire what I paint. So mm -hmm. I have, um, I taught from journal to canvas at one point, but it's really part of it. It's also how my style was formulated and developed. So when I knew what framework, like the technical framework that I loved, when I opened my journal pages, I gave myself permission to go hog wild with fracturing. Well, how do you fracture? Let's just make some scribbles. Um, mm -hmm. That is how my style was really fine-tuned in the pages of my books, because then I had no audience. It was just for me. There was no pressure to perform a product or create a product that the market could sell. Um, it was just my pages. So it was really incredible. And then I could take a page and go, I love how I did that section right there. What did I do? I'll write myself notes and then I'll go on my bigger works. Um, in fact, one of the paintings, the first painting that y'all put up of the figures um, of the family, the diversity is beautiful. Mm -hmm. There are three pages out of my journal that I cut out of my journal. And yes, that's so one. The, the tall character at the top, that is a 12 inch by 12 inch face out of a journal. Oh, really? The boy's face in the middle um, with the strong contrast that's distorted with the black bangs, that yeah. is painted on canvas in my journal. Oh, wow. And then the bottom left, um, that lower, that is called a split head. That started in my journal. Uh -huh. So, I, oh, yeah, I... Yeah, that one right there, because that's actually chalk pastel on paper. Oh. Wow, yeah. I'm, it's, um, wow. Is this, when you talk about fracturing, can you, mm -hmm. can you explain that a bit more? Okay, so his face yeah. is fractured in, it's, it's not normal, it's distorted. So it yep. says, if his face is folded up. Yep. Right? And, and then 
fracturing too. It kind of looks like stained glass, but it's convoluted. Mm -hmm. um, stained glass tends to be very predictable and very uh, symmetrical or patterned. My fracturing is just, if you look at the, the face with the flower, do you see the red, the left um, up at the top, the, the pink flower over to the right? Oh, this one, sorry. Okay, yeah. so you, do you see that red band on the side of its face? Yeah. And within that face, that face is fractured. So it's broken apart. Instead of just painting the face blue and a, a hair thing, hair red, it's all broken apart into those small little sections. I mm. also have a fascination with complex systems and pieces and parts. So the components of complex systems that seem to be random, all brought together, um, they show up as as part of why I love to fracture because I love to break things down into teeny tiny or smaller components mm -hmm. because it is the chaos of the breaking down that makes the whole work for me. Wow, yeah, very cool. Can you tell us a little bit more about this piece? So this piece, I was teaching distortion at the time and it's, this is, one of my most important pieces in the belief that diversity is beautiful mm. because in our society today, you know, on Instagram and socials, it is the beautiful, the put together, um, the people that we perceive as, oh, I want to be like them. And really it's, it's not about them behind the facade of their perfect skin or clothes are spirits that are broken a lot of times and imperfect. And mm -hmm. I wanted to embrace the differences and the diversity of we can be odd, we can be different, we can struggle, we can have um, problems with our skin or the shapes of our bodies, but we are still absolutely amazingly divinely made. Mm -hmm. So yes. that is why instead of painting realism, which I totally could do, I would prefer to paint the broken mm -hmm. um, in the way that I do because it emulates the journey that I took. Um, but it also, like I said, opens that bridge with the viewer because a lot of times viewers can connect with an something that's imperfect as opposed to looking at a painting that looks immaculately done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's, um, I think that's a tough transition for artists to get from that um, kind of painting right or capturing an image well, sort of realism to, you know, throwing that to the wind. And yeah. yeah. But two, the fundamentals are how I did that painting in the sense, the use of contrast, the use of composition, the use of expression, the use of values, um, patterns. Mm -hmm. All of that showed up to serve me so that I could paint in that way that it is oddly delicious. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, delicious, definitely. Oh, yeah, I'm just looking at your artwork. It's just fantastic. Um, yeah. What is your, uh, your process, like start to finish for a piece? Do you have 11 going at once? Are you focused on one at a time? I am a huge one for working in multiples. I teach it. Um, and it also depends on if I'm painting for a show or if I'm just doing daily painting, because I teach a lot online. A lot of what I'm painting has to do with coursework or studies for my students. But if once I get a show or a theme concept, um, I tend to build the narrative. Like I want to know the narrative. What is the meaning behind this show? Like in March, I have a solo show, The Celebration, um, The Abstraction of Carnival, because we are in Mobile, Alabama. It's the home of Mardi Gras. Mm -hmm. And um, it's an abstract show, so non-representational abstraction. So right now in my head, I'm already processing what are the components of Carnival masks and the colors and the floats and the energy and I'm just playing around with the concept of how do I abstract that out and when I get ready to start building those pieces I'll have formulated some plan yes this is one piece so this is a figurative piece it's all about carnival mm -hmm. um 
and also too I come from a family of professional clowns I used to be one <laughs> um, my clown name was Chubbis I was a hoop clown oh gosh you gotta really? have a, you have to have an inner jolly to be a clown I did <laughs> not um but it taught me a ton and yeah like 14 of my family members were clowns that's awesome so um I work that way but I also reserve weekly the ability to get in my journal and to create anything that I choose that's just intuitive that comes out mm. because what happens is if I try to predict um, or be formulaic in what I want to paint and the number and, and it's it's almost too scripted, I, I lose the sense of randomness okay. and life taught me that random things will happen unexpected things will happen so part of my framework was an additional layer of why I throw something just odd in is because life will do that to you mm -hmm. so I I choose to embrace the ability to be completely random at times you know I'll do what looks like regular portraiture and then I'll put um, some cherries up at the top for no good reason um, I just did a commission for a client with these three figures I just put it on Instagram and Facebook and the character has their hand and it's holding an upside down eyeball so a friend of my, a friend of mine said is that an upside down eyeball in that character's hand I'm like yes it is why did you do it I'm like because life throws you weird things sometimes and she's like good point good point so you know if you can have some sense of humor uh, that makes me sad now because I'm self-taught and I'm not connected to traditional art industry of gallery and agent representation, I know I take tremendous risk in what I paint and how I paint it. Mm -hmm. um, I know that I could have made different decisions and sold a lot more paintings than I do, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't be true to myself. Mm -hmm. So I just made the decision. I'm going to paint the way I love. I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. And I'm going to share my journey of why and how I do it with the audience that I'm connected to. And it's made all the difference in the world in my success because I have um, the last four years have been tremendously successful being an artist. So I, I just love to share that it can be done. Mm -hmm. totally can be done. Can you can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I think that is such a common I, I I'm there too, um, where I want to paint what sells. I don't think a lot about what you know, what expression or um, my painting is very joyful and colorful and whatnot. But um, yeah, just talk more about that. So here's my belief on that. We can be extraordinary painters. Technically, we can learn to render. But where we are in this day and age, if you don't have the ability through socials or either through an art agent to market your, you, then you're at a disadvantage. So what I quickly understood about the business was it didn't matter how good of a painter I was. If I didn't learn how to also be true to the business side and what markets require, I'm not going to sell. They're not going to come to my living room, you know, and buy a painting off my wall. So I had to learn to become interesting. Um, and, and part of me choosing to share my journey with truth and authenticity was this is where I'm at. This is what I'm struggling with. And over time, I built a connection of people and networks that valued my journey as much as my product right now I know that there's some artists that believe it's all about the product and I totally respect their point of view but for me I can only speak for um, what I experienced there's a lot of painters that are let's just say amateurish or lack the craftsmanship but they're amazing business people mm -hmm. and they can sell the paint off the wall yeah. So they're killing it with income. They just are. Yeah. So you really have to have some thick skin where you're at in this business, because not only really do you have to have a product that, that others can relate to, you've got to have some ability to get in front and be seen with creative confidence mm -hmm. and stay with passion 
this is why I paint what I do. This is this is why I love doing what I do and connect and build an audience. Um, and some artists do that through galleries, like I'm in Sophia La Gallery here in Mobile, Alabama. Mm -hmm. um, some have art agents, but I can't imagine doing it without the combination of the two. If you can figure out how to build an audience and connect with them through socials and you can paint what you love in the best way you know how, I have this phrase, paint what you love in the way that you love with the things that you love with devotion, mm -hmm. then you're going to build an audience. You just are. And then most likely you're going to build profit. Mm -hmm. But you've got to learn the business as well, meaning you've got to learn how to price your work. You've got to learn who your ideal clients are. You've got to learn the market demands. You've got to learn the best pathways for your work because you could have the most amazing work. But if you're in the wrong gallery, you're not going to sell anything. Um, there's a big part of all this being business understanding as much as creativity. Mm -hmm. And then making a choice as to how much you're willing to articulate and share to your audience and talk about your journey. Um, it has been an incredible experience for me just understanding how to build connection and growth. But I'm going to tell you what, it all stems from me being truthfully and authentically honest about where I started, what I experienced, this work for me. And this is what I believe and I'm passionate about. Mm -hmm. um, it does help being also not afraid to be in front of a camera. Yeah, doesn't hurt. <laughs> doesn't hurt. Doesn't. Or find somebody that's a great marketer or salesperson and have them work for you. Mm -hmm. um, there's many different pathways to financial success as an artist. Mm -hmm. It's just the belief of starving artists. I'm sorry, that's not what I experienced at all. And I came off of disability to do it, but I work so hard at it but mm -hmm. what I'm saying to the audience is it absolutely can be done it absolutely can be done yeah amen and that's part of what leveling up is here for too it's the starving artist uh it's a myth um yeah there is a way and there's not one way and that's why we try to have so many you know different um opinions and views with our masters like we have some that are uh, classical painters who are only gallery represented and that's awesome and we also have some that are self-taught that don't work with galleries at all or work with lots you know it, there's not one way to success but right. I love I love your message of authenticity that um, that you can and will find success when you're really honest about who you are yeah and yeah. learn the business learn yeah. the business yeah. Can you talk about the hashtag behind you, Push Past yeah. Ordinary? So Push Past Ordinary is kind of my life mantra in the sense of when I wake up and move through the world, when people like, where do you get your ideas? I'm like, I used to lick Play-Doh as a child. But <laughs> here's the thing. I have found that in order to create from a different or distinct point of view and create to create differently, because I paint faces, I paint abstracts, we all do. So how do I do them differently or how do I do them in a way that really uh, resonates in my bones that this is me? It's how I move through the world and open my heart and mind to pay attention to what's in front of me using my five senses. So mm -hmm. rather than moving through the world in an ordinary predictable way, like I practice visual creativity. I'll take my dog for walks and it's orange is the color of the day. So I'm acutely aware of things that I see in my path that are orange. Mm -hmm. I might look for, for uh, numbers. I might look for certain textures. I'm constantly teaching myself, okay, if I'm a visual person who interprets the world visually, I need to pay attention to visual acuity. Mm -hmm. So push past ordinary is the hashtag of what my life mantra is. I have not lived an ordinary life. I'm an ordinary person living an extraordinary life. Mm -hmm. So teaching others how to push past ordinary is why that hashtag exists. And then that little guy um, is my Fenton to Maxwell Pendergrass can the third because I'm working on a children's book. But um, I have a membership called the Push Past Ordinary Society which is where I share all this and I teach um, other artists 
how to actually tap in and move through the world creatively so that they can improve their creative confidence and their their technical abilities that they can learn to critique and understand what makes strong work or impactful work but it's all built around community um so it's kind of this four layer of a success circle but push past ordinary uh it's my thing mm -hmm. yeah clearly and i love that um i love that you have a mantra a personal mantra i think that's going to be my goal for this year um, we have a question from the audience. Um, what doubts did you have to work through personally? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> number one, when my body hold up, like, uh, am I going to take this risk? And am I going to physically be able to see this to fruition? Huge. Okay. Um, I didn't really struggle with the doubt of is my work good enough? Because because of my life experiences, I kind of just checked that box off and said, it didn't really matter if you think it's good enough or not. I'm going to do it because I love to do it to the best of my ability. But I also knew in the business world, would I be able to be successful? Would I be able to pull this off? Like when I got my first, um, you know, studio, the, the monthly rent, am I going to be able to afford this? Things like that were huge because it was risk. It was risk taking. Um, there were no guarantees. When I left the classroom and gave up a consistent income and health insurance guaranteed to do this. Now, thankfully, my, my amazing husband is so supportive and that part was taken care of for me. And then also, too, because of the disability in Medicare, but just the doubts of can I do it? Mm -hmm. um, and then emotionally how to maintain the consistent um, connection to staying uplifted in my mental health, it's mm -hmm. huge. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, there's days I, I dealt with the, the feeling of insignificance, despite all of my training and all of my experience and people sending me messages that have, have said, you've helped change my life. I mm -hmm. still dealt with feeling insignificant. Yeah. Um, and that's still just something that I continually work on when those doubts come in. Oh, you know, you're just doing a whole bunch of crap or you haven't painted in three weeks. What, um, it's, let me come back to center. Let me take a deep breath and come back to center. Mm -hmm. Um, but the doubts come in the doubts, they just do, uh, price point, right? Yeah. Who's going to pay that much money for a painting? <laughs> a lot of people do. Yeah. Uh, when raise, you know, when you want to raise your prices, is it really time? Who am I to be putting that kind of price tag on a piece of artwork? Yeah, I've worked my tail off. I've studied. Mm -hmm. So there's just things like that that come with um, taking that imposter syndrome and Keep doing a fast. coat check and putting it back in the closet and just <laughs> moving on in your fashion sense. Yes, totally. Just kick it in the butt. Yeah, before I forget, um, I always stay on the call after one of our events to talk about uh, what we're doing at Leveling Up and why we're doing it and how we're having so much fun together. Um, so I'll do that for anyone who's interested. You can stay on the call and I'll just chitter chatter about Leveling Up. Um, and I see Heather made a post for our members that she'll be um, in the Amaranth room tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Mountain Time to chat about this, about uh, all that you've shared, Artith. Uh, super inspiring. We have a few minutes left and I want to squeeze all of the juice out of you. Um, <laughs> I'm so grateful for all that you've shared. So um, at, at Leveling Up, we have like aspiring artists, emerging artists, professional artists. If there's one thing that you could say, um, you know, a word of encouragement, whether it's about the, you know, an artist's voice or courage or whatever, what would it be? Mm. If you have a passion uh, to use paint and pigment in your own way, be bold and brave and courageous mm -hmm. to understand why you love it and then be willing to share that with an audience, but tell them and explain why. Share the journey of why it matters to you. Mm -hmm. Share that with your audience because you might not be in a place where you want to go full-time as a painter, but the act of creativity and the act of being courageously bold in your creativity and then putting that out 
into the public space is what I call being a way shower because there's a lot of people that pay attention and watch and follow you whether you realize it or not on socials they need to see um, they need to see the light in your life even if it's a flicker or if it's like uh, Clark Griswold when he plugged it in and it finally went wah you know what I'm saying <laughs> um, it's inspiring to people and people need to be inspired and and not that we're painting just for others but it creates this energy that moves from us to that next person and you never know what your little bit of passion that you're willing to share publicly um, can do for another pe person in any given day mm -hmm. so uh, just be brave and courageous and share your creative path creativity matters in any form simple to complicated to professional to just a hobbyist because I love Play-Doh. Yes. Awesome. Wow. Fantastic. I'm going to watch this over and over and over again. Um, lovely. Thank you, Ardith. And one last thing too, I'm totally uh, willing to answer questions. I don't, I, I haven't paid attention to how many questions came up, but you can always email me at info at artistgoodwood.com and I'm on Instagram and Facebook too. Um, I love connecting with other creatives and painters and understanding where they're at. So yeah, I'm approachable. I'm not one of those, those I'm not one of those creatives that um, is over here and everybody else is over here. No, let's, let's hook up. Yes, yes, absolutely. That's what we're all about too is, um, yeah, we get further together and courage breeds courage and you're right, uh, way showers. I love that, that we, I think creatives rule the world. I think um, that we do show the way and we have courage and uh, we share that courage and we need each other, you know, to lean on. Some days I won't have courage and I'll need to lean on another artist who has it for me. Which is why the accountability groups and mentor groups matter. Those yep. groups matter. Yeah, they do. They really do. Why go it alone when you can go it with artists or another artist or many? Yeah, it's fantastic. Well, that's the hour. And I know there's a few questions we didn't get to. Um, sorry about that. Um, again, I'll stay on the call for a few minutes. Thank you so much, Ardith. What a gift you are to the world. And I'm so glad that we have you at Leveling Up. Um, and Thank you for the opportunity to come and, you know, share. It, it, it means a lot to me to be able to uh, talk about my journey because mm -hmm. it matters. Mm -hmm. It does matter. It does matter. And it's so encouraging.